I love fighting games, especially plat fighters. And if I had to point to one fighting game that helped spark my interest in the genre, as well as an interest in exploring just cool and crazy ass games of all kinds and their history, it would definitely be Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. Even if the crossover phenomenon is kind of becoming a bit overused in the platfighter scene as a whole, Smash still has always just remained evergreen for me. I never get tired of seeing Nintendo's biggest and best beating the absolute tar out of each other. It's good shit. And that's also probably helped by the fact that Smash just pours so much love and attention into each and every one of its characters they implement. Well, most of them anyway. But aside from a few outliers, most would agree that these are probably the most definitive appearances in a crossover fighter we'll ever get for most of these characters. But, as is the catalyst for most of the videos on this channel, a horrible little thought crossed my mind. More accurately, a question. The scope of its unnecessariness and who gives a fuckitude absolutely insurmountable. That question being, are the Smash Brothers interpretations really the best? The end all be all? What other fighting games have these characters appeared playable in? How are they different, and how have they stayed the same? Well, I've just gotta know, don't I? And I've got to tell you all about it. But first, ground rules. I'll be going over many different Smash Fighters appearances in various other fighting games, mentioning a little bit of the development of each of the games and how the hell they managed to snag these IPs in the first place, but mostly giving rundowns of the characters' movesets, mostly looking at the references they pull for the moves, as well as more general things like appearances, presentation, and playstyles. And at the end, maybe I'll give them a little grade based on how well I think they did. And also at the end, just because I think learning about character balance is cool, I'll be going over the balance for each and every one of these guys, if their game even has a competitive scene in the first place. And at the very, very end, I'll bring up some honorable mentions, as well as characters I'm honestly surprised didn't make the list. The only exception I had to pull here was that I'm not going to tackle any of the characters here who actually originate from a fighting game series. Not only because examining character translations from characters who originate from fighters would be pretty pointless, but if I were to cover every single fighting game appearance of Ryu, Terry Bogard, and Kazuya fucking Mishima, yeah, this video wouldn't be out until like, next year. And, I should add, it has to be a fighting game where you can, like, actually fight another living being. I never liked counting those technically fighting games, but you only fight computer opponents. Yeah, no. And, I should also say, this took even longer to make than my Mario appearances video. Like, almost two months straight of working on it, day in, day out, so... Any support you're willing to give? Likes? Subs? Even just sharing it with your friends would be immensely appreciated, but, you know, no pressure. And to kick things off, we've got most of the Mushroom Kingdom, all in one FG. Oh, and Sonic is here too. Don't worry, Sonic has plenty of his own fighting games, so he will get his own section. I'm just sneaking him in here for now, and we'll get back to him later. Now, what possible fighting game could I be talking about that has these many Mario characters playable in one game that isn't Super Smash Bros.? Why, it's... Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games! <sighs> Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games. After the last two videos I did, I was kind of hoping I wouldn't have to say or type that name for at least a little while, but nope, right back at it. And I know what you're saying right now. You clicked on this video expecting some real ass fighting games and you get a mini game collection. But wait, hear me out. So 
on top of the basic Olympic events, you know, 100 meter dash, hurdles, high dive, all that stuff, we've actually got a combat sport in here, fencing. And it plays like a fighting game. And it also plays really damn basic. You have a parry, a feint, and a thrust. Each of the characters has like some minor stat differences and maybe different hitboxes. The goal is to hit the opponent about 15 times and you win. And yeah, that's about it. I mean, yeah, basic works for a silly little minigame collection like Mario and Sonic, but it doesn't leave much in the way for, say, interesting combat. But the MS games do have something up their sleeve. Dream events, which are the basic Olympic events you know and love, but given a crazy twist that makes them a bit more interesting, along with a bit more of a Sonic or Mario flair to them. And here, we've got something even more looking like a traditional fighting game. We've got a health bar rather than a neutral interactions one counter, supers, and even ring outs. Now, the super bar here may go up to three, but it works in the third strike style of stocks, so you can only do one type of super here, which kind of stinks. Another disappointing thing is that the supers seem to be character type specific rather than character specific. Speed characters get this flurry of strikes, all arounders get this big charging stab, power characters get a big old bash, and the technical characters get a projectile. There's some cute touches, like Peach shooting out a heart and Yoshi opting to use his tongue instead of his saber, but other than that, you know, pretty fine or whatever. And then, over the years, they just kinda kept the same stride going. The DS port had both regular fencing and dream fencing, and dream boxing on top of that, weirdly enough, even though there's no regular boxing, and while the supers from Dream Fencing carry over basically the same animations from the console port, the supers in Dream Boxing are all actually character specific, which is a cute touch, even if they are all basically just cutscene supers. Then both the console and 3DS versions of London 2012 came, in which someone on the team said fuck it and just made the supers part of the normal ass fencing. Which in turn, I can only assume, made the previous iteration of Dream Fencing feel a little less special, so they decided to then on turn the Dream Event versions of their combat sports into Mario Party minigames rather than fighting games. Oddly enough though, in Rio 2016, they opted to ditch fencing in favor of boxing. Which I mean, might sound cool and different, but it does just kind of boil down to the same sort of attacks for each character and maybe a flashy super, so not too different from the fencing crap. And then, over in Tokyo 2020, fencing makes its return alongside boxing, with a brand new combat sport on top of that, karate! And I don't know, it's all just kind of the same shit. With such a focus on semi-realistic depictions of the sport, there's not much in terms of character variety or character expressions, except for stat differences, and maybe like a homing attack here and a Yoshi tongue there. I guess the most interesting and honestly weirdest bit of character detail they added to this game is giving Wario like dark, evil, purple stank powers when he uses his supers, which is just kind of a strange choice. I don't think the character's ever done that in any of his games, but you know, cool. Overall, understandably generic, but generic all the same. I'd give it like a D. Going from a dry fart of character expression in an FG character to one of the best on the list, we have Link from The Legend of Zelda. In his one fighting game appearance outside Smash, Soul Calibur 2. As you probably know, Soul Calibur 2 was ported for each mainline console at the time of its release and each console version actually got its own exclusive playable character. The PS2 version came out with Heihachi Mishima from Tekken, the Xbox version got Todd McFarlane's Spawn, and the GameCube got Link. Though, funnily enough, the PlayStation version was originally going to have Cloud from Final Fantasy as their guest character. So, you know, I could have been talking about this game twice. 
Anyway, Soul Calibur being a fighting game series focused on medieval fantasy sword fighters duking it out, it made Link a very fitting choice for this game. And his inclusion, along with Spawns and Heihachis, helped kickstart the series' tradition of including guest fighters in all future titles. But onto the character. Everyone knows about Link being in Soul Calibur 2, but what's he actually like? Well, starting with the appearances, as we all know there are many incarnations of the character, and this one appears to be based on the adult Link from Ocarina of Time. And he even comes in shades of red, blue, and purple as alt colors. And of course, for weapons, he's rocking the iconic Hylian Shield and Master Sword. Except, that's not all he can actually use. In the game's Weapon Master Mode, basically the game's Campaign Mode, you can earn gold and use it to purchase different weapons for each of the playable fighters, Link included. All of which being fun little references to weapons and items he's used in past Zelda games. It's really cool. Oh, and also he can use the Soul Edge, I guess. Okay, but enough about looks. How does he actually play? Well, let's start with the most standout thing about his kit, which is the fact that he's the first ever Soul Calibur character to have projectiles. He has three to be exact, his bow, bombs, and boomerang. Since Soul Calibur is an eight-way run fighter, these are actually stances he goes into by holding down particular button combinations rather than them being inputted like special moves or whatever. They all function exactly how you think they would for the most part. Bows shoot straight, hit hard, and fly far. Bombs go the least amount of distance, naturally exploding upon hitting their target. Though if they miss their target, they'll actually roll on the ground for a set amount of time before exploding. And you can even cook them a bit before throwing them. And the boomerang is a bit of an in-between. It doesn't fly nearly as far as the arrows, but, you know, it comes back. And some of these stance changes are actually baked into some of his basic combo strings, allowing for extensions only he could ever dream of getting, or just going in, getting some hits off, and immediately being able to go back into projectile shenanigans. It's a really neat concept. Outside of this though, the rest of his toolkit is a little below average to compensate. Kinda slow, stubby pokes, big ass mix-up buttons to try and open up his opponent, but are absolute death on block, though he does actually have a pretty decent grab game. Getting into those moves on a purely visual level though, they are actually super faithful and referential to iconic Link's sword moves of the past. Of course he has the classic big chargeable spin, would be a sin if he didn't, and he can even use it to spin into the air just like his up special in Super Smash Bros. Though here it's just a launcher instead of a recovery tool. They have his jumping slash from Ocarina, his pogo attack from Zelda 2. Dude, and even the Pegasus boots charge from A Link to the Past? That's awesome. Even down to his basic sword swings, they just feel so Link, you know? Probably one of the most authentic translations of a guest character, like, ever. Which makes sense when you learn in classic Nintendo, this is my baby, don't fuck up my baby fashion. They pretty much breathe down the dev team's necks the entire time they're making the character. Every little decision, every little animation had to be approved by Nintendo. Which makes some of the more questionable parts of his toolkit even more funny, like the grab where he hops up on your shoulders and starts smacking you in the ass. Like, I don't think you can be doing that, man. Come on. As to the voice actor chosen to belt out those high-pitched squealy noises, we have Nobuyuki Hayama, the voice behind Adult Link from Ocarina of Time, as well as Link in Smash 64 and Melee. Soul Calibur 2 actually marks his last performance as the character. Funnily enough, Hayama just so happened to be on the Soul Calibur team as the voice behind series mainstays like Nightmare, Siegfried, and Yoshimitsu, so this worked out perfectly. Though I have heard people say he does sound a little off in this game. Have a listen. Yeah. 
Though sadly, this is where this story takes a turn. I have been singing this character's praises, but now we have to talk about balancing. How good of a character he actually is in a competitive sense. And Link in Soul Calibur 2 fucking sucks. While he is the only character in the game with projectiles, which you think would be friggin' huge, his projectiles are actually shockingly easy to deal with. You can pretty easily just sidestep and duck every arrow he slings at you, bombs are pretty much only good as combo enders, and boomerangs just... don't. So with, like, the main thing meant to compensate for his shitty moveset basically being non-functional, what you're left with is a subpar everything else. Most of his moves are unsafe as hell, so if you don't want to keep getting hard punished, you gotta stick to his more basic attacks. And even then, his basic stuff is extremely underwhelming even by most character standards. He's just kinda bad at everything. I mean, I'm not trying to say your character has to be friggin' S tier for me to say I like them, but like, you give me a character with all this cool shit, all these neat ideas and cute little references, and then you make it so I can't even use that cool shit because it sucks so bad, then I don't know, I'm gonna be a little disappointed. Man, I was so ready to give this character an A, but like, after learning how ass they are on a competitive level, I don't know, I'm gonna have to give him a B, sorry. Weird how Kirby just straight up has a fighting game series. Well, two of them to be exact. What started as a silly little sub-game in Kirby Triple Deluxe sort of just went on to become its own game, even getting a whole ass sequel on the Switch. On top of just a completely different fighting game on the 3DS as well with Kirby Battle Royale. Most of the roster straight up just is a Kirby for all these games, just with his different copy abilities, but I'm not really going to count those for this list because on top of being kind of just against the point of the whole video, I'm more interested in what different things they pull and moves they take for their standard versions of the characters rather than some hyper-specific powered-up version. It's also the fact that the copyability Kirby's literally just have the movesets they have in the game, so basically just be me saying, Oh, here's Sword Kirby. He could do the moves Sword Kirby does. Oh, here's Cutter Kirby. He could do the moves Cutter Kirby could do. So on and so forth. There's also the point where if I went over an entire roster's worth of characters across four different games, we'd be here all day and it'd be really boring. So let's just, yeah, let's just not do that. But since regular Kirby isn't anywhere on the table, we're just left with his friends, Meta Knight and King DDD, who appear playable in both Battle Royale and Kirby Fighters 2. And I'm not gonna take too long on either of those either. Kirby Battle Royale is a top-down, four-player, free-for-all fighter. This game has a variety of crazy-ass game modes where you collect apples, fight giant monkey robots, and just a bunch of other crazy horse shit, but there is one featured game mode that is just a straight-up free-for-all fight to the death, so we're gonna mainly look at that. This game also has modes that play from both a top-down and vertical point of view, but the actual fighting mode is strictly top-down as well, so we're just gonna stick with that too. Starting with Meta Knight, he's pretty much just a souped up version of the sword power up from this game. Has the same jumping attack and jabs and all that, which is fair. That's mostly how he is in the games he's playable in anyway. Though weirdly enough, he has no Meta Knight staples, like the shuttle loop or sword dives or anything like that. The one move he does have unique to himself is his charge move, an attack where he disappears into thin air, teleports a small distance and quickly reappears, owning the shit out of anyone unfortunate enough to be caught near. As for DDD, kind of the same shit as Meta Knight. His basic attacks and Y move are just the same as the hammer power up, but you know, that makes sense because that's what he plays like in the games. Same as Meta Knight, the only thing he has special for himself is his charge move. In his move, he spins his hammer wildly before chucking it at his enemy and then it fucking explodes. This game does actually have alt costumes for its characters, and they're all actually like really cool. 
Meta Knight's got a lot of referential stuff. You know, you gotta look based off Dark Meta Knight, Mecha Meta Knight, Galacta Knight, and possibly even Tuxedo Mask. DDD's alts are mostly originals though. He's got one where he's rocking a beanie, rocking a monocle, rocking a very kingly crown complete with a scepter, and the only one based off a of reference being his masked DDD costume from Superstar Ultra. The last thing I want to bring up is the voice they chose for Meta Knight. It's nothing like the really deep, ominous voice they gave him in Brawl, or even the accent they gave him in the Kirby anime. No, this one's, uh... Uh, 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 uh. Sounds like some guy? I have no idea who voices Meta Knight or King DDD in this game. The only voice credit is given for Kirby's voice actress, so... I don't know, I mean, DDD has famously always been voiced by Sakurai himself, but to the mystery voice for normal guy Meta Knight, I guess we'll never know. On to Kirby Fighters 2. For the most part, Meta Knight and DDD literally just play how they play in Kirby Star Allies, albeit slightly tweaked. And while that does make it probably one of the most accurate translations of a character to a fighting game on this whole list, it unfortunately doesn't really leave me with much to talk about. No interesting interpretations or weird gimmicks, they just control how you'd expect. Though, luckily for us, there is actually one interesting thing we can still talk about. Character balance. As Kirby Fighters 2 actually does have a small but dedicated competitive scene. Here's a little competitive rundown I got of the two characters upon asking the Kirby Fighters 2 competitive discord. Meta Knight is largely considered the best character in the game due to exceptional air mobility in a game where that's kind of rare large and safe ground normals, shuttle loop being just ridiculously broken, and overall just extremely high damage potential. All complemented by Blade Beam, a riskless projectile that he doesn't struggle to charge due to his aforementioned high speed and mobility. DDD though is pretty bad overall. He has ridiculous damage, so he's not unusable or anything, but generally slow moves and a massive hurt box make it hard for him not to get camped or outpoked, and his one projectile hammer throw is too slow and goes too high to be a real anti-zoning tool. Alright, and up next, a huge wave of Pokemon characters. Pikachu, Lucario, Charizard, and Mewtwo. All in Pokemon's very own fighting game, Pokken Tournament. What was originally pitched by Bandai Namco as a simple collaboration between the Tekken and Pokemon franchises quickly took off into becoming the Pokemon series' very own flagship fighter. It originally released on the Wii U, but later on received an enhanced port on the Switch with whole new characters. None of which we'll be talking about today. Also, did you know in Germany the game is literally just called Pokemon Tekken? That's because Pokken sounds a little too similar to the word Pocken, which is the German word for smallpox. The gameplay style of this game is actually very interesting as it switches between two different phases. A field phase, where the game plays similar to an arena fighter, and a duel phase, where the game plays a lot closer to, well, Tekken. Pokken still to this day has an extremely active and dedicated player base with tons of helpful information and super comprehensive character rundowns out there in the YouTube sphere already. So I'll just be giving you the Sparknotes version of what these characters play like and feel like. But if you want a more insightful deep dive or just want to see the rest of the cast of this crazy ass game, I recommend taking a look at the video Koro Usami did on the subject. Starting with Pikachu, he's a pretty decent all-rounder with some pretty good zoning capabilities and decent pokes to play footsies with, though his combos once he does get an opening aren't always the greatest, unless he's in his synergy burst mode, which he can build up the meter for super easily. Of course, this being a Pokemon fighting game, a lot of the special moves you can pull off are just moves you can do in the games. Pikachu's move selection here is pretty nice, mostly all electric moves of course, 
He does have two special moves here that carry over from Smash Brothers, being Thunder and Volt Tackle. Though Thunder actually homes in on the opponent rather than Pikachu himself like an ultimate, and Volt Tackle here is a simple DP rather than his final smash. The moves that are in his toolkit that aren't actually in Smash are Nuzzle, a command grab, a couple more projectiles with Thunderbolt and Electro Ball, and a personal favorite of mine, Iron Tail, which on hit is a hard knockdown. Going into his aforementioned Synergy Burst mode, it overcharges the Electric Mouse, giving him better extensions on some of his combos, and his super is a Volt Shock Fist, a move where Pikachu rushes you down and punches a hole clean through you like goddamn Superman. This move could also be an anime reference, as the final blow Pikachu delivers in this super is very similar to the one Kid Goku delivers to the Demon King Piccolo in original Dragon Ball. Now, another cool part of these characters' movesets is that for some of their normals, they actually borrow moves straight from famous Tekken characters. With Pikachu here actually borrowing mostly from Hey Hachi of all characters, giving him the Demon Spin, the Hell Axle, and even the Electric Wind God Fist. I mean, damn! Lucario is a Shoto, plain and simple. Fireball, Dragon Punch, Advancing Special with Active Hitbox, no fancy aura mechanics here. If you like characters who are good at everything with a focus on footsies, Lucario is your man. Dog. Jackal God of the Underworld. Just going over the Shoto basics, he uses Aura Sphere as his projectile, which can also be fired in the air a la Akuma, has Extreme Speed as his Dragon Punch, and Bone Rush as his approaching hitbox move. The first two of these you might recognize as his neutral and up specials in Super Smash Bros. The one other move he has that doesn't fill out the Shoto checklist is Force Palm, a chargeable blast of hand energy with decent range and at full charge actually leaves you plus on block. Lucario's synergy burst form transforms him into Mega Lucario, which increases his damage substantially and alters his moveset pretty drastically, all of his projectiles and moves getting substantial upgrades. And for his super, he uses Aura Blast, where Lucario charges up a bit before unleashing a Hurricane Uppercut, launching the opponent into the air before sending a barrage of smaller Aura Spheres to hit them, ending the attack with a massive Aura Laser. Lucario's Tekken counterpart is Lars, although he does borrow a little bit of Fang too, it's just kind of tucked in there. Charizard is a flight stance character and a grappler all wrapped into one, with pretty decent combos and air combos to boot. Good pokes, crazy movement, and a devastating command grab. What more could you want? On the ground, Charizard has access to two specials he shares in Super Smash Bros. Flamethrower and Flare Blitz. Although, unlike in Smash Brothers, Flare Blitz can actually be angled, either at the ground or straight ahead through the air, but still causes self-damage. For new grounded moves, he gets Inferno, a sweeping fire attack that stuns, Fire Punch sends Charizard shooting forward, working well as a counterattack, which can also be cancelled into his flight stance. And for his devastating command grab, he uses Seismic Toss, which can even be used in the air. And being a Flight Stance character, he gets some exclusive moves he can only use while in flight. Those being Air Slash and Dragon Claw. For his Burst Synergy mode, he transforms into Mega Charizard X granting him a double jump, and allowing him to cancel his moves into flight stance earlier for better combos. And for his super, he uses a Searing Blaze, where he does a mid-air spin before slashing the ground with energy, and powers up a giant fire beam before unleashing it on his foe. 
And finally, the Tekken character Charizard borrows most from is Devil Jin. Mewtwo is an all-arounder with some crazy fun tools, great projectiles, and a command counter that can be cancelled into a teleport, command grab, or an armored reversal. And despite all that, this character is still seen as pretty honest, albeit a pressure monster. For his projectile, he uses Psycho Cut, which if it hits, can be followed up with a homing, dashing slash. He also has a beam attack with Hyper Beam, which takes a while to charge, but it can be cancelled into teleport. For his command counter, he uses Barrier, which can be cancelled into four options. A counter strike with Confusion, a grab with Telekinesis, and an advancing multi-hit attack that saps health with Drain Punch. Or, once again, he could just use Teleport. For his Armored Reversal, he has Psy Strike. Using his psychic abilities to swirl a bunch of rocks and his opponent in the air before slamming both into the ground. He has a fun little Rekka sequence with the different elemental punches, starting with a fire punch, leading into an ice punch, and finally ending on a thunder punch. And for his final special move, he has Focus Blast, where he launches a chargeable purple ball of death at the ground. Very Frieza of him. For his Synergy Burst mode, he transforms into Mega Mewtwo X, which grants him altered properties for his specials, as well as spending less energy consumption in general for his EX moves. And for his super, he uses Psy Disaster where he locks his opponent in a psychic grip before flying at them and punching them into oblivion. And finally, the Tekken character Mewtwo borrows from is Devil Kazuya. In summary, Pokken molds these characters into a fighting game fucking flawlessly. Each character is super true to their source material, while also being given enough of their own distinct flavors to keep them interesting. While I didn't go over it in the character rundowns, even the characters most basic of normals just have so much care put into them. Pikachu looks and plays just as zippy as you'd want him to. Charizard glides around gracefully but lumbers and slugs his attacks. And I absolutely adore what they did with Mewtwo in this game. He comes off not only as just a powerful psychic type Pokemon, but the bioengineered freak of nature that he truly is, with his crazy hodgepodge of powers from stretchy limbs to mental projections, shooting fucking fire and lightning out of his hands. This is a million times better than the Smash interpretation where he just kinda shoots purple at people and sucks ass. My only tiny complaint is that Lucario here feels a little bit boring, but I mean, he's a Shoto, so kind of comes with the territory. Pokken gets an A. Hell, an A+. Plus. Phenomenal work. And finally, as for the ever-important balance, Pokken tournament YouTuber Jukum ranks Zazard at C tier, Pikachu at B tier, and Mewtwo and Lucario at A tier which is very similar to the rankings I received from the Pokken Tournament Discord, albeit with a slightly different tiering system. Moving on from Pokken, we have Sonic Terrence Hedgehog, with a handful of fighters to his name, starting with a fighter that, for the first time on this list, actually predates the character's appearance in Super Smash Bros. Hell, it predates the Super Smash Bros. franchise entirely. Of course, we're looking at Sonic's playable appearance in Sonic the Fighters. Basically, if you haven't heard the story before, it goes a little something like this. Back when Sega actually had consoles out on the market, they had their very own arcade division. That division was known as Sega AM2. Sega AM2 were responsible for a couple of arcade classics, some of which were even fighting game, namely Virtua Fighters 1 and 2, and most importantly, Fighting Vipers. Well, sometime during the development of Fighting Vipers, lead developer Yu Suzuki walked in on one of his programmers messing around with the game. 
as he had put in a model of Sonic the Hedgehog and basically turned him into a playable fighter, which can actually still be found and accessed deep within the code of Fighting Viper's arcade release. And well, apparently Suzuki thought the idea was damn brilliant. So much so, in fact, he pitched the idea of a Sonic fighting game to then head of Sonic Team and insider trading enthusiast Yuji Naka, who absolutely loved the idea too. And that's how we got Sonic the Fighters. But enough preamble, Sonic the Fighters is a two-button 3D fighter. Well, three if you count the block button, I guess. Should I count the block button when I say how many buttons a fighter is? But for real, yeah. A punch, a kick, and a block. Sonic the Fighters mostly prides itself on its approachable control scheme, but that's not to say there isn't some hidden depth to it. But yeah, still kind of rambling here. Let's get on with taking a look at Sonic himself. Starting with appearances, obviously, with the game coming out in June of 1996, Sonic was definitively still in his classic era, so his design here is reflective of that. And damn if it isn't so damn good, this is some primo classic Sonic shit. Man, can I just say I love this weird, almost low poly, almost not style this game has going on. I don't even really know how to describe it. Like how his belly is so close to being just a straight up round sphere, but still has that little bit of chunkiness to it. And the way his ears and feet and quills all come to sharp points. It just looks so cool. On to game feel, Sonic feels perfectly average, if you ask me. He feels nice and zippy enough, and all of his moves have pretty good range. Though, if you ask me, I guess I wish he felt a little bit faster, you know? Just feels a little tame for the fastest thing alive and all that. He shares the rest of the cast's ability to interact with the barriers on the stage, climbing up them to pounce on his opponent and shooting off them to catch them off guard. The only other real unique thing about him in the mechanics department is that he does share this one unique ability to actually turn himself around. The only other playable character in the cast being able to do this being Tails. And while this does have some niche competitive application, it's a little more than just kind of a neat thing you can do, I guess. As for standout special moves, he has this silly little volleyball fist technique, and the spin dash move, which can either be used as a straight up spin dash at the opponent, or he can actually stall it by doing a couple donuts across the arena. It's pretty fun. And there's even some recognizable moves here that would be ported over to his appearance in Super Smash Bros. Most notably, this big-ass donkey kick that would be his forward tilt, this big-ass wind-up punch that would become his forward smash, and even his down tilt is in here. To cap off this rundown, I guess I should mention the closest thing Sonic has to a super in this game. You see, in the bottom left you have five of these little barrier things, which basically allow you to block. If your opponent does too much damage to one of these, or hits them with a powerful move, it breaks. These five barriers carry over rounds too, so if you use up all your barriers, you will be unable to block for the rest of the match. But you can also burn one of these barriers intentionally to enter hyper mode which visually appears to be based off the invincibility power-up from the Sonic series. This mode allows you to perform your attacks at twice the speed as usual, and also gives certain characters unique moves. With Sonic's special move being Emerald Dive, which is just this Psycho Crusher looking thing. Yeah, it's kinda whatever. But it is, in fact, something. As for balance in the competitive scene, as I'm writing this, YouTuber Wustoons has actually put out a phenomenal YouTube video on the game's entire competitive history, so if you want a deeper understanding of the game's ins and outs, you should definitely check it out. But as for the short and sweet version, Sonic is regarded as one of the game's top tiers, right alongside Knuckles. His rushdown game is strong, and he has the ability to absolutely tear through his opponent's barriers with relative ease. 
Sonic Battle is a two-button isometric arena fighter for the Game Boy Advance. I couldn't actually find anything interesting regarding the development of this game, which is a shame because I'd love to know who was so dead set on having a Sonic fighting game on the GBA of all systems. Especially after the franchise's last attempt at a fighting game flopped as hard as it did. Sorry, Sonic the Fighters. Jumping right into the gameplay, being a GBA fighter, the moveset here is obviously going to be pretty limited, considering we only have, like, two face buttons to work with. But the game attempts to alleviate this by actually allowing you to choose your moveset. Sonic here gets a choice between three different move types, those being Shot, Power, and Set. Shot revolves around Sonic being able to spin into a ball so fast he can shoot out waves of energy at his opponents. Power's whole gimmick is that they seem to be based off of Sonic's old power-ups from the adventure titles, mainly his bounce and his light speed dash. And Shot has Sonic laying bombs on the ground, what? You get to choose one for three different categories in a match each of which filling out a different part of Sonic's moveset. The first category being ground, so that will be your ground special, the other set to air, and the last one is actually pretty interesting as it'll be set to your block, meaning if your opponent tries to hit you with a move in whatever category you set defend to, then that move will be automatically blocked no matter what. So it's kind of got this rock, paper, scissors thing going on. And you even get the chance to change it with every death, so that's kind of handy too. And even aside from the whole unique mechanic being tied to them, I think the special moves here are actually pretty cool. Especially the light speed dash special, I think it's just really dang interesting. Being able to toss a ring out onto the field and having it bounce and move around, being able to zip over to it at any time, running into opponents and causing damage. I'd love to see things like this in other arena fighters, or maybe even a plat fighter. I don't know, I just really like neat projectiles like this. And I have no fucking idea what they were cooking with the whole bomb thing. Turning Sonic into some sort of green goblin ass mad bomber is fucking crazy, but you know what? Blowing people up in video games is always fun, and it's a fun move here, so I'll give it a pass. My previous mild complaint of Sonic the Fighters has also been alleviated here with the crazy speed of this game. Being able to zip over to your opponent at a moment's notice definitely helps with that. Sonic's look in this game is mostly based off the way he looks in the Sonic Advanced games, but obviously given a lot more animation to it. I love the way Sonic does moves in this game, you can feel that adventure era attitude oozing off the guy, it's awesome. And believe it or not, Sonic here actually does have a voice. Of course, being a product of the adventure era, he's voiced in English by Ryan Drummond, Time to party! Here I come! Ha! Ha! Yes! And in Japanese by Junichi Kanimaru. It's showtime! Ma, that to go now, Monsa! Eku de! Ha! Toria! Yes! Also, last minute edition here, apparently Sonic and the Black Knight has a battle mode too? It's another isometric arena fighter, and it's not too interesting, so I won't be spending too long on it. Basically, Sonic plays as he does in the main game, but being able to move around freely instead of just in a straight line. Being based off Sonic in the fucking Black Knight, Sonic uses a sword for all his moves. And all of these sword animations are ripped straight from the base game. Being able to use the Soul Gauge in combat is cool, but that's about it. Looks like up next, we've got ourselves another little blue character. Capcom's very own Mega Man. With Capcom, you know, 
pioneering the fighting game genre, being responsible for one of the most popular fighting game series of all time, and having a massive swath of other button bashers under their name to boot, it's no surprise that the Blue Bomber has appeared in at least a handful of them. Oh, and just for the record, we will only be looking at classic Mega Man here. No Mega Man X or Volna to be found. Now, originally I knew that Mega Man 7 had its own little secret battle mode, and honestly didn't think much of it, since it just seemed like it'd be another take how they play in the regular game and just let them kill each other type thing. But actually, this game does have some interesting tidbits to go over. Like the fact you can only have one pellet on screen at a time instead of three, so, you know, they're clearly thinking about balance here, which is nice to see. And there's also the fact Mega Man actually has his own special moves in this mode. Pressing down twice and hitting jump lets him do this little slide attack, and a quarter circle forward and shoot makes him shoot out one of Slash Man's Slash Claws. But instead of being just a close range move like in the game, here it's actually a projectile, shooting out diagonally upward. And he has this one last interesting little dodge move with Faint Warp where he does the little animation of when he warps out after defeating a boss, but kind of just gets stuck halfway through and gives up. This keeps him invulnerable for a few seconds, allowing him to dodge projectiles and even stalls him in the air. He even gets an alt color here, being the same color palette he changes to when using any of his rush abilities. I mean, yeah, it's pretty simple and silly, but it's plain to see that some actual effort was put in here, which I can appreciate. But onto that real shit, though. Mega Man in Marvel vs. Capcom 1. The culmination of what was just a simple hidden character in an X-Men fighting game, then slowly but surely snowballed its way into becoming the ultimate crossover fighter we know today. MVC1 is a six-button, two-character tag fighter, which differentiates itself from other tag fighters by having assists, but not from your usual other selected character, no, but from this big-ass menu of various selectable assists you get to choose from. It also features the Variable Cross technique, also known as the Duo Team Attack, which allows you to summon both your selected characters on screen at the same time for massive combos and huge double supers. Honestly, I'm actually kind of hyped to talk about this character as he is probably the most interestingly different from his Smash Bros. counterpart on this list. And we're actually going to start with his moves, because the first big difference from Smash Bros. is that Mega Man in this game can actually throw hands. While Smash Bros. Mega Man has all of his base moves reflective of his various Robot Master weapons, this Mega Man isn't afraid to let his fists fly, throwing out punches and kicks and uppercuts, and even this big-ass donkey kick launcher that I really like for no real reason, I mean... I don't know, Mega Man's got some big-ass feet, it's nice to see him fucking use them. He again has his slide here as his crouching heavy kick, and he even has his Mecha Upper, a move that I swore originated here, but as it turns out, actually debuted in Mega Man 2 The Power Fighters. Another fun detail is by pressing Heavy Punch, you can actually shoot his Mega Buster at any time, it's an instant projectile. And you can even charge it for more hits and damage by holding the button down, which you can do pretty much during any action no matter what, even while performing combos. But now getting on to probably what you were waiting for, the special moves based off Robot Master weapons. Which sadly here he only has three. The one he has access to right off the bat is Tornado Hold, which is the ability of Tengu Man from Mega Man 8. It works exactly as it does in the game, shooting out this little helicopter rotor blade thing onto the ground, which creates a tiny tornado. In order to access the other two Robot Master weapons at your disposal, you'll actually have to order them in first with another special move, Item Change, which summons Eddie, one of Dr. Light's inventions and one of Mega Man's best robot buddies who drops it off for you. Those other two Robot Master weapons in question are Leaf Shield, Woodman's ability from Mega Man 2, and Mega Ball, a miscellaneous ability given to Mega Man at the start of Mega Man 8. 
Leaf Shield here, unlike Mega Man 2, doesn't actually harm opponents by you walking into them with it active, but it will protect a single hit of damage from the opponent before going away, no matter what that hit may be. You can also shoot it at your opponent, although it does travel rather slow. As for Mega Ball, it pretty much works exactly how it does in Mega Man 8. Mega Man shoots it out onto the ground, and it'll lay there until Mega Man hits it. Then it'll go bouncing around the screen until it, hopefully, hits the opponent. Now onto the weird supers that aren't really a Mega Man thing at all, starting with two similar in concept. Beat Plane and Rush Drill. Rush Drill turns Rush, Mega Man's little transforming robot dog, into a drivable drill vehicle, which Mega Man then uses to drill at his opponent. This is a fully controllable super, and pressing any of the punch buttons is what actually makes the drill drill. Rush Drill is actually close to being an actual thing from the games. As stated before, Rush is well known for turning into helpful vehicles which Mega Man can ride to help him fight or get past obstacles, but he's never specifically turned into a drill before, which makes this a little odd. As for Beat Plane, Mega Man summons Beat and merges with him to turn into a plane. This one is also fully controllable with the punch buttons firing bullets and the kick buttons dropping bombs. And now this one just absolutely doesn't make any sense. While Beat is known to assist a Mega Man on his adventures, he doesn't transform like Rush does. So this super is very, very odd. But I mean, at least Mega Man gets a cute little scarf, that's kind of fun. For his last super, not to mention his most what the hell is this super, is Hyper Mega Man. Mega Man combines with Eddie, Rush, and Beat to turn into a giant fucking robot that starts shooting out lasers and missiles and even smaller lasers that are shaped like Beat and Rush, and you gotta mash the fuck out of the buttons to get more damage, and it's just crazy! Obviously, Mega Man has never turned into this thing before, like, ever. Like, it's kinda similar in concept, kinda, to the Rush armor from Mega Man 6, but at the same time, it's completely fucking different. It's just... I don't even know what this is. In reality, though, these extremely odd supers are actually references to the classical 70s anime that inspired Mega Man himself. I don't have time to really get into the nitty gritty of it for this video, so if you're interested, I recommend watching this little video here by The Seventh Force, who does these really good MVC character breakdowns. But for the short of it, Beat Plane and Rush Drill are references to the same transformations that Kashan's robot dog Friender undergoes in the anime Kashan, and Hyper Mega Man's design is a reference to Mazinger Z. And the second thing that's unlike the Smash interpretation is that Mega Man here actually has a personality. Unlike the one in Smash Brothers, who is an unwavering cold machine, who only expresses himself when he gets hurt or maybe looks a bit mad when he's charging his Mega Buster, the Mega Man in this game is actually super expressive. He looks determined as fuck in his idol pose, celebrates when he wins, taunts his opponent for fun, they actually made him kind of an annoying little shit in this game, and I kind of love it, honestly. On top of that, he actually has a voice in this game. He sounds a little more high-pitched and shrill than he did in the most recent title at the time, Mega Man 8, but I think it works. <laughs> Speaking of voices, voice actress Kaoru Fujino lends her talents as the voice behind Mega Man in this game. This is actually the only time she's ever voiced the character. But, she has lent her voice to other Capcom fighters in the past, being the voice behind Elena, Poison, and Effie in the first two versions of Street Fighter 3, New Generation, and Second Impact. Now look, opinion time. 
MVC Mega Man may objectively be super weird and not a great translation of the character proper into an FG like Smash was, but in my mind, it's a borderline classic. I feel like his little handstand donkey kick launcher is iconic enough it should have made it into Smash. That's how crazy I am about it. This may be bias speaking, I also just really love playing the character. Being able to run around and blast people with Mega Buster shots in the neutral makes me feel like a zoning little shit, and he's honestly just really dang fun to play. But I'd realistically give this appearance like a C. New bonus info. We weren't quite done with Mega Man's super moves, as it turns out he has a secret super. Okay, so backstory time. Mega Man's arcade ending in Marvel vs. Capcom 1 is a funny little scene that parodies how he gets Robot Master powers after defeating them. He runs to the center of the screen before warping away to a screen that says, You have collected Magnetic Shockwave, which is also a cute reference to previous Versus games, as Magnetic Shockwave is one of Magneto's supers which makes sense in this context because the final boss of this game is Onslaught, who is a psionic entity created through the melding of consciousness between him and Charles Xavier. Okay, getting off topic. Basically, in the arcade version, it's nothing but a cute reference. But in the PS1 version, after first beating the arcade mode as Mega Man, and then holding down select as you select him on the select screen, you can actually use Magnetic Shockwave as one of his supers. It's orange here instead of blue, which is weird, but other than that, yeah, pretty cool. Mega Man also does appear playable in the legendary Marvel vs. Capcom 2, but aside from some mild moveset tweaks and changes and some new alt costumes, it's pretty much a total copy-paste job from MVC1 Mega Man. You see, when people try and tell you that Hmm, fighting game rosters are just too tiny nowadays. Back in the good old days, games like MVC2 launched with 52 playable characters. They're not taking into account that only a total of 7 characters were actually made wholly original for the game, and the rest were just ported in from various other Capcom games or Marvel fighting games developed by Capcom. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to shit on the goat here, it still has a kick-ass roster that's a complete ball to play, but, you know, let's be realistic here. So yeah, no changes here, except Magnetic Shockwave being absent, I guess. So, let's move on to the final Mega Man FG appearance before Smash Brothers. This is my destiny! I'm strong! You'll lose! Let's do this! I mean, this is technically classic Mega Man, right? Just a really fucked up version of him. The story behind bad box art Mega Man in Street Fighter Cross Tekken is also a little interesting. Basically, at the time of its conception, Mega Man was hitting an all-time high. Mega Man Universe was just announced, a fucking ugly-ass, hyper-realistic military shooter Mega Man game was in development, and of course, who could forget, the third game in the beloved Mega Man Legend series was just on the horizon. It was looking like a good year to be a Mega Man fan. So the development team over at Cross Tekken thought to themselves, you know, with Mega Man in this game, let's just have a little fun with it. They actually ran through a couple of interesting reimaginings of the character before settling on bad box art. You know, just a fun little thing for the fans to enjoy. And then Universe got cancelled. And then Legends 3 got cancelled. And Mega Man fans were stuck with this. Anyway, fittingly being based off Mega Man 1 box art Mega Man, this is a very Mega Man 1 geared Mega Man in terms of special moves. Here, he has Ice Slasher, Iceman's power as a slow moving, freezing projectile. An air-exclusive projectile with the Lechman's electric beam, which shoots forward, down, and directly up. And even his forward throw animation is similar to that of Gutsman's ability. 
As for non-Mega Man 1 related moves, of course he has his Mega Upper, and instead of being his heavy punch, his Mega Buster shot here is now a Hadouken motion. Most of his normals here also appear to be taken directly from his MVC appearance. Hey, he even keeps the crazy ass donkey kick that I like, nice. And finally, for his super, known in this game as a crossover art, he whacks you with the butt of his blaster before charging at you, firing off three pellets, then jumping behind you and blasting you in the ass before tossing you off to his buddy to finish the job. Going on to looks and personality, I do kind of actually like just how uniquely much of a shitter he is. I like the detail where his little ridge bumps on his head are constantly sliding around as if this was some sort of homemade costume he slapped together and it's just falling apart at the seams. And overall, he's just kind of generally portrayed as just being kind of dopey and stupid. In his English dub, he talks in a very Adam West old TV serial hero kind of way, saying corny shit like, and Although the Japanese dub doesn't actually really do anything fun like that, he kinda just sounds like a grizzled old guy. In the English dub, he's voiced by Chris Kaysen, most well known for voicing Mr. Popo in Dragon Ball Z. And in the Japanese dub, he's voiced by Naoki Koshida, with only a handful of other voice credits to his name which I guess makes Bad Box Art Mega Man his most iconic role. What a joy. Honestly, it doesn't even really feel fair to grade Bad Box Art Mega Man. I mean, they took Mega Man and they purposefully spinned him in a crazy ass direction just for fun, so I don't think I could really grade it on the same basis as I did for the other authentic fighting game translations, but... Nah, I don't know, I think he's silly. I think I'll give him, like, a C. <laughs> Especially with the backstory knowing this was all supposed to be just a fun little joke, but due to unfortunate cancellations of other games turned into the biggest slap in the face Mega Man fans have ever experienced, I think that's worth it. As for character balance, MVC1 Mega Man has always been regarded as a eh, kind of mid-tier, kind of lower mid-tier character. As for MVC2, Justin Wong and Chris Matrix, both extremely talented MVC2 players, ranked Mega Man as almost high tier in a 2022 tier list. Unfortunately for Cross Tekken Mega Man, while Cross Tekken does have a competitive scene, sadly Mega Man, as well as literally every other cool guest character in the game, are exclusive to the PS3 version of the game, and most players are either playing through the Steam or Xbox 360 releases, so you're not gonna see much competitive use of him. And speaking of PS3 exclusive DLC characters, with Capcom sneaking in their own silly unrelated mascot character into the mix, even if he may be horribly deformed, of course, that meant Bandai Namco couldn't be left out of the fun. So you know what that means. Oh shit, here comes Pac-Man. Okay, appearances. As for the little yellow ball himself, Pac-Man's pretty much just rocking the look he had in the 2010s. You know, in things like Pack Party, and Pac-Man the Ghostly Adventures. Down to the weird pupiled eyes and the custom Pac-Man sneakers. But of course, that's not the only distinct visual he's got going on in this game. As you can see, he's sat on top of a giant fuck-off wooden mech, piloting it with two levers and a giant red button. And while Pac-Man at this point did have a weirdly involved history with giant controllable mechs, the design of this thing doesn't actually originate from Pac-Man at all as its design is directly based off of Mokujin, a living wooden training dummy and a playable character from the Tekken series. Now, I thought this was going to be another situation like the Pokken characters, where he would have little bits and pieces of Mokujin's moveset baked into the character, but as it turns out, Mokujin doesn't have a moveset. 
he's actually a mimic character, stealing the entire moveset of a random character per round, so without any interesting moveset stuff to pull from, Mokujin's mostly just here for looks. Oh, but one cute little detail is, if you look really closely on the back of the mech, you can actually make out a faint little Pac-Man arcade screen, which shows Pac-Man getting chased by Inky, which is a cute detail. And if his moveset doesn't feel very Mokujin, it doesn't exactly scream Pac-Man either. He has a couple of specials, a move called the Pac-Dash, where he runs at you and hits you with a chest bump, an ass slam air attack special called Hip Attack, a flash kick type anti-air move with flip kick, and the only real referential move in his toolkit, a fireball move called Pack Dot Attack, where he shoots a Pac-Man dot at you, and that that's that's it. And for Pac-Man Super, he has Pack Laser where he hits you with a string of attacks before fiddling with the controls of his mech for a bit, then firing a laser out of Mecha Kujin's eyes as the Pac-Man jingle plays. And just like Mega Man before him, Pac-Man also actually has a voice in this game. Same for all regions too, voiced by Debbie Derryberry, who you might know better as the voice of Jimmy Neutron. <laughs> Pac-Man and Cross Tekken, although the Mokujin mech is kind of a fun idea, overall just has such a fucking boring generic moveset. This shit just doesn't feel Pac-Man at all. I mean, you could slab literally any character you wanted over this and it'd feel just as generic and nothing. I should also mention that Cross Tekken actually does have alt costumes for its characters. I didn't mention this during the Mega Man segment because Mega Man doesn't actually get any here, but Pac-Man does, and I think it's really funny because his alt costumes literally just get rid of Pac-Man. So I think that just goes to show just how little Pac-Man actually contributes to the overall moveset. I guess the one thing I do like about the Pac-Man interpretation in this game is Pac-Man's personality. They just made him a fucking horrible psychopath who loves fucking killing people. But, sad to say, other than that little detail, Pac-Man and Cross Tekken is the worst thing a fighting game character could possibly be. Just kind of fucking boring. He gets an F. Moving on. Ah, Little Mac. The character who, even though his whole series is based around a combat sport, I'm still surprised he has as many fighting game appearances as he does. Even if two of them are just battle modes in his own game. To start us off, we have the hidden battle mode in Super Punch-Out, but, I mean... Little Mac literally just controls the exact same as he does in the actual base game, so there's nothing really to talk about. Really, it'd be more interesting to talk about the previously uncontrollable playable fighters you get to play as in this game, but that's not what this video is about. So we're just gonna move right along to his only fighting game appearance not in a Punch-Out game. EA's Fight Night 2 for the Nintendo GameCube. You see, back in the old GameCube era, in a bid to get more third-party support for their console, Nintendo decided to become super buddy-buddy with Electronic Arts, not only reducing GameCube licensing costs for the company, but also allowed EA to use their very own licensed characters in their various sports games to help boost up sales. So yeah, not only is Super Punch-Out playable as a bonus game in Fight Night 2, but by either beating the game or just punching in a cheat code, Super Punch-Out Little Mac becomes a playable fighter. Fight Night 2 is a boxing sim game, so there's nothing really crazy to note in terms of, like, moveset stuff. Everyone throws the same punches and takes the same hits. It's really just up to different stats at the end of the day, but there are some things to note. Like just how fucking 
goddamn gross little Mac looks in this game. Like, holy shit, wow. His super punch-out look did not translate well at all. Also, since this is a grungy, realistic boxing game, you get to experience the joy of seeing one of Nintendo's NES icons punching the fucking blood out of real-life boxers like Evander Holyfield and Muhammad Ali. And then in between rounds, you get to massage and clean the bruises and gashes on his gross-ass caveman brow. Like I said, what a joy. And final thing of note, this game does a silly thing where it randomizes his place of birth in like every intro. His hometown can range all the way from Seattle, Washington, all the way to Tokyo, Japan. Weird. And finally, Punch Out Wii has its own little battle mode. Head to head mode. Little Mac versus Mustard Mac. Winner takes all. This is actually pretty different from, say, the battle mode in Super Punch-Out, as it actually does a lot to change the game's mechanics to suit a 1v1 format. For instance, whiffed punches here have a lot more end lag than they would in the regular mode, leaving your opponent more opportunities to get a hit in if you're careless. But the real interesting part is when the blue meter on your character portrait fills all the way to the top because that's when you transform into Giga Mac. As Giga Mac, you hit harder, get access to a whole new array of attacks, and you can even taunt to gain star punches. Although this does come at the cost of you being a lot more lumbering, and whiffing your punches leaves you much more vulnerable than you would be as Little Mac. What I find really interesting is that you don't actually get to choose when you transform, it just sorta happens when the meter reaches the top. Which makes me wonder how this would be viewed in a competitive sense, like, maybe Gigamac actually secretly kinda sucks and you wanna avoid changing into him at all costs. I wonder if there's any other fighting game characters like that, but who knows. In summary, while I think the Fight Night 2 Mac inclusion is super hilarious, Punch-Out Wii is the obvious winner here, though all my praise of it is more geared towards how the mode itself is implemented rather than any sort of authentic character translation, so maybe Fight Night 2 Mac is the winner by default? Who knows? Now, truthfully, full disclosure here, going into this video, I was pretty confident I was at least relatively intimately familiar with all the game franchises I'd be talking about. Aside from one, that being the Final Fantasy series. I mean, I've played up to Kingdom Hearts 2, but that's about the extent of my exposure to Square's legendary RPG franchise, so I had to do a lot of extra research for this specific category. So please do let me know if I have gotten anything wrong in the comments section. And big thanks to the Final Fantasy Wiki for having so much helpful information handy. Oh, and, uh, heavy spoilers for Final Fantasy VII. Final Fantasy's Cloud Strife, I'm surprised to learn, has actually made a number of fighting game appearances, even before his Smash Bros. debut. In fact, he has the most overall on this list. Not counting the Olympic Games, I mean. So, let's start with, well, the first one. Releasing only a little bit over a year after Final Fantasy VII itself was released, and it's probably the first and maybe even only game you can think of when talking about Cloud Strife in a fighting game outside of Super Smash Bros. We have Air Guys. God bless the ring. Air Guys is a isometric 3D fighter, originally developed by Dream Factory, a subsidiary of Squaresoft, and published by Namco for the arcades. The arcade version only contains both Final Fantasy VII's Cloud Strife and Tifa Lockhart as playable characters, but the PS1 port, which was developed by Square themselves, contains several more. Starting off here with just looking at his normals, you'll probably notice that they're... Uh, not really what you'd expect Cloud to be doing. Punches, kicks, uppercuts, running tackles, takedown throws, and even fucking suplexes, oh my god. 
as the GBTR in the title may imply, although even Air Guys' baseline characters, not even counting the FF7 ones, may have arm cannons and other crazy stuff like that, a lot of its characters' moves fall under the same baseline of wrestling moves. So while Cloud having crazy ass grabs like this might be pretty strange for him, it's pretty par for the course for just existing in this game. But Cloud isn't only hand to hand here, oh no. He actually can swap into his sword here via a weapon stance, which at the cost of not being able to block, gives him access to a couple of basic sword swings, as well as two moves based off his limit breaks. Braver, and Meteor Rain. He also has Omni Slash as an SPD, which is like super awesome, right? But okay, I can do a 360 degree move, right? I can do an SPD. But the one in this game is just fucking ridiculous. I spent two hours alone trying and failing to get this command grab and it just wouldn't work. So here's footage of a legend who actually could. Although in this video he actually lands it as Zack. But as far as I know the two are actually echo fighters in this game sharing pretty much the exact same moveset. Going right into voices and appearances and all that, Cloud here, you know, definitely based off his Final Fantasy VII look, I mean, it's not like he had any other looks to base it off of at the time. As for alts and costumes, Cloud gets a red alt color here, as well as an alt costume with him dressed in his security guard outfit. Also, Cloud has two different voice actors in this game, exclusively in Japanese, one for the arcade release and one for the PS1 home port. Sadly though, I only have sound files for Sasaki's performance, and it's mainly just fighting game grunts anyway. <laughs> And these two would technically be the first voices ever given to the character. Although, this would also be their only times voicing the character. And that about covers Air Guys for Cloud. But, there is another character we need to talk about. Because as we all know, wherever Cloud goes, no matter what game, he won't be too far behind. That's right, Sephiroth also makes a playable appearance in Air Guys, being one of the PS1 exclusive characters, and will also be playable in every subsequent fighting game Cloud is playable in as well, so yeah, this will be a Cloud and Sephiroth segment here. And on top of that, I think this version is just so damn interesting because at the time of its release, as I said, there was only Final Fantasy VII to base a moveset off of, and you don't ever actually get to fight a regular version of Sephiroth in this game. There's only his safer Sephiroth and bizarro Sephiroth transformations. And I guess there's also the part where you insta one-shot his ass at the end there, but that's barely anything to base a moveset off of for a regular Sephiroth. So let's take a look at what they actually did manage to pull from and what new stuff they were able to bring to the table. His hand-to-hand -hand stuff is just as wacky as Cloud's in this game. If you ever wanted the one-winged angel to give someone an express ticket to Suplex City, then this is the game for you. Though in comparison to Cloud's hand-to-hand -hand style, Sephiroth's definitely feels a bit more tricky, a lot more underhanded. He's got some sneaky high-low mixes hidden in there. And of course, just like Cloud, Sephiroth can use his sword as well. And while it does contain its own direct references, they did add an original element to it as well. This little quick draw sword slash stance he can enter, where he can shimmy around a bit and give himself access to unique and quick sword swings. He also comes with his own 360 SPD grab, which I also can't do, which is his impaling stab, which he just really loves doing to Cloud in various Final Fantasy outings. Though this time he doesn't just get yeeted off a cliff like a fucking dumbass. He has this tricky ass overhead stab off a body blow, which 
do I even need to explain where this is from? And he also has... Meteo Rain? I mean, it's probably more so meant to be a reference to Supernova, but I mean, why make it look exactly like Cloud's Meteo Rain? He's got a couple of big, meaty swipes reminiscent of when he murdered the fuck out of Tifa, or maybe just that one random guy in the village. Unlike Cloud, he doesn't have any color alts, but does have a shirtless alt. And only being in the PS1 version means he only has one voice actor. Here, he's voiced by Shin Ichiro Miki, a name you might recognize being attached to a character from earlier in this video, as he is the current voice actor for Charizard, which is insane to think about. So yeah, that about does it for Air Guys, but that definitely is not it for the Final Fantasy segment. Because did you know that Final Fantasy actually has its own fighting game franchise? Because I sure frickin' didn't. Introducing the Dissidia series, a series of 3D arena fighters, or dramatic progressive action games, as the developers would want you to call it. A series that first started on the PSP, it's pretty much Square's very own crossover fighter, branching together years upon years of Final Fantasy characters from all across the series, just so they can beat the absolute shit out of each other. It's a story as old as time. Fighting is strange in this game, as attacks are actually split up into two categories, bravery attacks and HP attacks. At the beginning of the match, you and your opponent not only start with a set amount of health, but a set amount of bravery points as well which indicate your total amount of offensive and defensive power, and hitting your opponent with a bravery attack saps them of their bravery points and gives them over to you. So it's got this kind of tug-of-war thing going on. Also, fittingly, this is a fighting game with a lot of RPG elements. You can deck out your fighter with as many different stats and armors and buffs and summons as you want, but for here, we're just gonna take a look at the moves. You can assign up to three different moves at a time to use in four different categories. Grounded Bravery and HP Attacks, and Airborne Bravery and HP Attacks, all of which are performed with dead simple inputs, just a direction and a button press is all it takes. Starting with Cloud, a lot of his moves are based off of his various limit breaks from Final Fantasy VII. And he even gets Omni Slash version 5 as a move in this game. A special version of the move he uses to defeat Sephiroth in the 2005 animated film Final Fantasy VII Advent Children, which actually marks this as its first game appearance outside of the CGI film. He also gets a couple of moves that were made up for him in this game, like Rising Fang, Aerial Fang, and Sonic Breaks. And for his ultimate, he just has Omni Slash, as you would expect. But a neat detail is that his weapon actually changes to Final Fantasy VII's Ultima weapon before he unleashes it. His fight style is still very fast and slashy like Smash is, but I do like the fact that he actually ends up using a lot more magic here, like the different versions of Fyra to Fyraga. I mean, the guy is the second best magic user in Final Fantasy VII after all, he should be slinging out some more spells here and there. Another fun difference here is that Cloud isn't exclusively voiced in Japanese. In the English dub, he's voiced by Cloud's then-current VA, Steve Burton. That was a joke. Do what you want. You might feel sorry for you. Who was the main voice for Cloud up until the remakes rolled around. And for his Japanese voice, we have Takahiro Sakurai, who still voices Cloud to this day, and is the same voice for him in Super Smash Bros. He has three alts here, one that's his Advent Children outfit, one more heavily resembling Yoshitaka Amino's concept art for the character, and finally, one based off his design in Kingdom Hearts 1. 
Moving on to Sephiroth, here he actually has a completely unique look for this game. It appears to be a mix between his look and compilation of Final Fantasy VII, which if you don't know is basically all the Final Fantasy VII supplementary content, you know, like Crisis Core and Advent Children and all that stuff. You can tell because of the added straps to his coat, as well as the missing crest from his chest. It also borrows elements from Yoshitaka Amano's concept art for the character, with the beads on his sash. And you can even see on the little bottom flaps of his coat, they gave it a white and purple lining as a reference to his safer Sephiroth transformation. On to moveset, he gains some of his more recognizable moves, like Octo Slash and Shadow Flare, moves he picked up in Final Fantasy VII Crisis Core, which set the baseline of moves for a non-transformed Sephiroth. Here, unlike in Smash Bros., however, Shadow Flare actually summons four tracking orbs on wherever your opponent might be, rather than having to hit them with the whole finger snap booger flick move first. And here is actually where he first gets Skintilia, his counter move, and for the most part it works the exact same. He has Black Materia, a chargeable move that summons a giant meteor right on top of you, charging it increasing the damage of course. And finally, for his ultimate attack, he has Supernova of course, but he, like Cloud, also changes his form a bit when using his ultimate, popping out his famous One Wing. Onto voices and costumes, he also gains some all costumes here, one based off his OG look from Final Fantasy VII, a Kingdom Hearts alt, and what would be a Sephiroth appearance without a shirtless alt. He's voiced in English here by George Newbern, Sephiroth's go-to English voice actor before the whole remake thing happened. Everything returns to play. <laughs> and his Japanese voice is Toshiyuki Morikawa, who remains his current voice actor to this very day. Dissidia did get a sequel, Dissidia 012, but nothing here has really changed. Sifroth gains exactly one new move, Transience, but that's literally it, and Cloud more or less remains the exact same. So we're just gonna head right to the third game in the series, Dissidia NT. Starting off Dissidia NT, we actually are gonna go over a couple of major gameplay changes, as now it's not only a 3v3 team fighter, but the movesets here are actually all predetermined now, no changing them like in the other games. Starting with Cloud again, he loses some of his conversions, like Omni Slash V5, but gains some pretty cool moves to make up for it, like Cherry Blossom, where he summons blasts of various magic to drop right on his foes' heads, kind of like an inverse of Sephiroth's Black Materia move. He has Braver, a big chargeable dropping slash, and Terminal Vortex, a new tornado projectile. Omni Slash here also gets dropped from being a super to just being a normal ass attack in this game. It's just a bunch of rushing slashes here, nothing too crazy. Characters also have a special EX mode they can now enter that gives them character-specific buffs. Cloud's EX mode is Limit Break, which grants him increased defense and lowers the amount of charge time for his attacks. Sephiroth also retains most of his moves from the other Dissidia titles, though it does come with some mild changes like Shadow Flare now casting an immediate explosion right on top of the opponent instead of summoning four energy balls. And, like Cloud, he also gains some new moves, like Telluric Fury and Empyrean Wrath, just a couple of basic slashes from his sword, with Empyrean Wrath basically just being the air version of Telluric Fury. But the cool thing about these slashes is that they're actually dash cancelable, if he times it right, he can dash out of the end lag of these moves and keep up the assault. Aeolian Onslaught, which sounds a little inappropriate, has him lunging forward at his opponent after a bit of charge time. And finally Zanshin, 
an aerial braver attack, which allows him to float for a bit while sending out three slashes of energy from his katana. Voice actors here are all the same, and the only new alt costume these guys get is for Sephiroth, where he gains a look based off his safer Sephiroth form. Now, as mentioned before, I am not any sort of expert on Final Fantasy VII or its characters, but I'd say these interpretations are all pretty solid. I mean, Air Guys is obviously pretty dang silly, but I think seeing characters and weird ass interpretations is always fun. And also taking into consideration just how little they had to go off of at the time, I can give it a pass. And the Dissidia games are also pretty decent, even with weird battle systems and controls aside. It seems a little more flash over function to me, but hey, for a little PSP fighter, I think it works. I'd give them both, like, a C. As for character balance, at least in Dissidia NT, I couldn't find any sort of definitive source of information. I could only really find stuff like tier hubs charts and random reddit threads, but the average consensus I seem to find across all of them is that Cloud is one of the best characters in the game, while Sephi is just considered pretty alright. Okay folks, now we're finally in the home stretch. Just a couple of little appearances left, and we are done. Funnily enough, going from one Smash 4 demon to another, we have Bayonetta in her playable appearance in Anarchy Reigns for the Xbox 360 and PS3. Anarchy Reigns, the pseudo-sequel to the Wii cult classic Mad World, is mainly a beat-em-up on the surface. But it does contain a surprising number of online battle modes, ranging from straight up one on one battles all the way to 16 player free for alls. And being developed by Platinum, the same studio behind the Bayonetta series, made sense to feature Bayo in it. At least as a pre order bonus, anyway. Gotta push those sales. Gameplay is pretty much what you'd expect out of the most modern beat em ups light attacks, heavy attacks, a jump and a grab. And a lot of our basic strings are also what you'd expect, all pretty recognizable from the games. And hey, you can even juggle enemies with your guns just like in the Bayonetta titles. Though it does feel like something's missing here. There's a Madama butterfly sized hole where a big ass boot should be, if you know what I mean. Well that's because her wicked weave attacks are tied to what is known as the killer weapon mechanic in this game. Holding down LT on Xbox, or L2 on PlayStation, allows characters to get more damage off of their combos at the expense of spending a little bar located underneath the health bar. And that's not even the end of it, she has her flying air kicks as well as her heel stomp, and even more risque moves like Pole Dancer. Which I guess is also something I should probably bring up. Since this game is rated M for Mature, Bayo decidedly gets a lot more naked in this game. Which, you know, I guess it's pretty in line with her character, so yeah, cool. Honestly, I'm just a really big fan of how this game takes advantage of the camera. Since this is a 3D arena fighter instead of a 2D plat fighter, they can get a lot more crazy with the camera angles and presentation. It manages to catch a lot more of that Bayonetta flair, though part of me does wish they managed to go at least a little bit further with it. And yeah, that's about it. Overall, I think I'd give this appearance, like, a B? It keeps super true to the character, giving them the much needed flair that they deserve. Though at the end of the day, I feel like they could have gone a bit further. I mean, her hand and feet guns are pretty iconic, but Bayonetta has a whole arsenal of crazy ass weapons to pull from. I was kind of hoping we'd get to see more of that. But hey, other than that, not bad for day one DLC. Now onto the very last character, and from another platfighter no less. We have Simon Belmont in the Japanese exclusive Dream Mix TV World Fighter for the Nintendo GameCube. Finally, the crossover fighter everyone was begging for, Konami versus Hudson, 
versus not even video game related at all, Japanese toy company Takara. Look man, you can have Optimus Prime and Megatron fight Bomberman and the fucking Moai heads from Gradius. What more do you want? Trying to get even the slightest bit of insight into why this was even made, I got the inside scoop from the Transformers Wiki of all places. <laughs> Thank you Transformers Wiki. At the time of its creation, Konami owned about 20 million in stocks over at Takara, and it was in the middle of acquiring Hudson. So this game was created to help generate hype and interest across all three companies in one fell swoop. Funnily enough though, not even two years later, Konami would sell all of its Takara shares as the company had been underperforming. And following that, Takara would merge with Tomy only a month later, so guess it didn't really pan out. And of course, featuring Konami. Who else to helm the Konami spot other than Simon Belmont? Stepping right into the mechanics, the gameplay is a little bit different than most other plat fighters. Rather than blast zones or health bars or any of that crap, every game actually plays like a coin battle. You and your opponent start with a set amount of coins, and every successful hit knocks them out of you. When someone eventually runs out of coins, they instead drop this little floating heart thingy. If the player who dropped it manages to get it back, they get a second chance at life, but if the opponent gets it, then they win. The movesets in this game are actually dead simple. He has four attacks, a basic three hit whip combo that makes him crouch, an up angled whip swing attack, a forward whip with longer reach, much more resembling like it is in the NES games, and an air version with a weirdly bad hitbox. The whip overall also just kinda animates like fucking trash in this game, like damn that doesn't look very good. And he has a couple of specials, or should I say, three different spins on the same special. He has his classic boomerang cross attack, and he can either throw it out straight ahead, up at an angle, or have it circle around him like a shield. And he can have up to two out at a single time. Now I'm just gonna be up front, Simon is extremely basic in this, and honestly, they really could have done anything more. But, I won't lie, just being able to fill up the screen with all these crazy ass crosses is pretty fun. As for appearances, you may have noticed how distinctly different this Simon looks. Instead of going with the well-known Conan design from the NES to the SNES games, they have instead gone with his look from Castlevania Chronicles, giving him longer hair and an overall black and red color palette. Which I mean is a far cry from his more established design, but it's a design I really dig and just sort of the one he had at the era, with them not bringing back Simon's NES design up until the release of Smash Ultimate. Simon also gets three color swaps here. A blue alt, an alt color more resembling his NES appearance, and a turquoise alt color. I do like me some turquoise. And of course, being a Japanese exclusive game, Simon only speaks in Japanese here, being voiced by Hideo Ishikawa. Same guy as Smash Ultimate. Surprise! Solid Snake also makes a playable appearance in this game. And I'm just gonna lump him in here real quick in the Simon segment because it, it won't even take me a minute to go over this guy's moveset. Here he carries the same famous CQC jab sequence he has in the Smash Brothers games. And his two other moves are just this little up kick thing he does both in the air and as a running attack. I don't know why, but I was kind of hoping he'd have his infamous up tilt in here for some reason, but nah. The only actually neat thing here is that Snake actually gets a cargo throw here, like he's fucking Donkey Kong or something. Cargo throws feel kind of rare in the plat fighter scene, so it's nice to see a character who has it. And just like Belmont, all of his specials are based around one tool, his C4 explosives. Just like Smash, he can stick it onto any surface as well as sticking it on enemies. 
But here, he can just straight up hurl that shit through the air. Which obviously gives it a lot more utility. His skins are also a lot better here too. Although his main design appears to be more based off his look in MGS2, he has an alt for his look in MGS1, an alt based off his Iroquois Pliskin disguise also from MGS2, and one where he dons a tuxedo, which is a recurring bonus costume in most MGS games. And just like Simon, same voice actor as the one in Smash Ultimate, being of course voiced by Akio Otsuka. I think it's neat seeing how Snake C4 worked so similarly to Smash's before he made his big brawl appearance. It makes you wonder if maybe Nintendo took some inspiration from this. And obviously, they could have done so much more with this character if this was a more fleshed out fighter, but it is what it is, and at the end of the day, let's be honest, hurling a shit ton of explosives at your enemies is always a pretty good time. And the alt costume selection here is also pretty fun, so... Eh, what the hell, I'll give it a C. Okay, okay, okay. But back to Simon. And the very last game on the list. Castlevania Judgment is a 3D arena fighter, published by Konami and developed by Aiting, a studio that's no stranger to fighting games, having worked with Hudson in the past to create the Bloody Roar series, as well as, more recently, the I have no fucking idea if this game is good or not, DNF Duel. But why a Castlevania fighting game for the Wii, you may ask? Well, Koji Igarashi, the at the time producer for the Castlevania series, wanted the Wii to have its very own Castlevania game, especially taking interest in the Wiimote's motion controls. He originally wanted to create a more standard Castlevania game for the Wii, having the player swing the Wiimote like a whip in order to get the playable Belmont to do the same in-game, but then came to realize that prolonged Wiimote flailing might become physically tiresome to the player, especially since action games like most Castlevania entries didn't have many opportunities for the player to take breaks. So he had the brilliant idea to instead make it a fighting game, as there would be more opportunities to give the player breaks between the action. A fighting game with motion controls. Cause those usually go over so well. Anyway, on to the gameplay. And the interesting thing about Simon in this game is that he actually isn't a zoner in this game. Yeah, I mean, with all the projectiles he has in his home series, and the whip, just all ranged weapons all around, you think that'd just sort of be the default for every game he's in. But no! I mean, his whip still has reach, but nothing super drastically crazy, and he doesn't even get a single projectile to his name, aside from the universal ones given to every character at the start of a match. In fact, he's actually a very combo-heavy character, and even gets this crazy-ass head-first dive move he can do at his opponents. It's honestly really cool seeing a Simon who gets so up-close and personal. And that's pretty much it for moveset stuff. His moveset options aren't too terribly deep, you know, being a Wii game and all. So that just leaves us with his appearance and design. What the fuck? So, they decided to do something a little bit special for this game. They had Death Note artist Takeshi Obata redesign every single Castlevania character for this game. Now obviously, Takeshi is a very talented artist, and honestly, a lot of the other redesigns are fucking stellar, especially for the more monstrous characters of the cast, but oh. What he did to our boy Simon is unfortunate, to say the least. Like, I'm not gonna sit here and pretend like I'm some expert character designer or anything, but, like, the revealing-ass black leather outfit that barely covers anything, with all the straps on his vest and whatever the hell's going on with his shorts, it's just way too fucking busy and over-the-top, and just doesn't resemble Simon at all. 
like, I actually remember this looking a lot less bad in my head and was completely willing to go to bat for it, but really just sitting down and looking at it, yeah, even I can admit this is just way too fucking much. He also comes with three different alts, I think? Okay, so he has this one blue alt color, right? But then alts 3 and 4 are just his normal and blue color, but is there like a difference here I'm not seeing? I pulled up both in game, and I'm just not seeing a difference here. The man behind the voice, at least in English, is Keith Silverstein, who also is his English voice in Smash Ultimate, but get this, also voices Street Fighter 6 Dalsum and Vector the Goddamn Crocodile which is just kind of wild to me, honestly. And is voiced in Japanese by Kenichi Suzumura, most well known as the voice actor for Zack in Final Fantasy VII. At the end of the day, despite not being very true to character and looking like... that, I really do dig that this take on Simon is much more hands-on than you'd expect. Breaks conventions and all that. Still gonna have to give it a D, though. And that may be all the big fighter appearances we have to talk about, but we still have just a couple of little honorable mentions to go over. I know for a fact that Kingdom Hearts Chain of Memories had its very own little battle mode where Sora faces down against an evil Shadow Clone version of himself, but that game plays more with Chain of Memories' weird-ass card system, and it just doesn't really gel with what the whole video was about, but I thought I'd at least mention it here. Same with Minecraft PvP. The game's just too non-traditional and into its own survival mechanics for me to really talk about anything meaningful here. And finally, that is every single Smash character who's appeared in a fighting game outside of Super Smash Bros. Holy shit, that was a lot. But I do feel as though I've learned a lot from this. I found some dope-ass interpretations of characters that I really love. Found some interpretations that try something new or cool or at least have one good idea attached to them. And in some circumstances, learn to just appreciate what I have. As for characters that I'm surprised never received any guest fighter appearances outside Smash, for being as old of a franchise that Dragon Quest is, and being so well known for as many crazy ass spin offs as it has, not one of them is a fighting game. I mean, come on, if Final Fantasy can have its own fighting game spin off, then why not good old Dragon Quest? Also, I swear to god, there was a Game & Watch boxing game that I could have brought up as at least an honorable mention, but no, I looked, one does not exist. I was wrong. As it turns out, there totally is a Game & Watch boxing game. I have no idea why I couldn't find it when I first did research for it, but uh, I'm glad I went back to double check. Yeah, it's real. Consider it a little bonus fighter for those of you who decided to stick around to the end. And yeah, that's all from me. If you're still here, thanks for sticking around till the end. Like I said, this video really took a lot from me. But I've just really been wanting to blow people out of the water with a real standout video after my last big one. And I've just overall been wanting to take this YouTube thing a lot more seriously in general. I've been thinking about setting up something like a Patreon or something like that. It would genuinely be really cool if I could do something like this for a living, but you'll probably see something like that for me in the future. This video is already a little overdue, so I feel bad plugging a Patreon on it or anything like that. Speaking of being late, I figure I should probably have something akin to an upload schedule if I'm gonna take this thing a little more seriously. I'm gonna aim for at least one video a month. So you'll still be getting some interesting videos from me, albeit they'll just be a little shorter. Maybe I'll even throw some opinion pieces in there. I've still got a lot of ideas, so stay tuned, and once again, thanks for watching. See you next time.